Mr. Broder. All right. The floor is yours. First of all, I want you to know I'm 90 years old. <laughs> Pearl Harbor was December 7th, 1941, and I was a senior in high school, and Monday the 9th, most of the male students that were uh, third or fourth year did not show up in school. They were busy uh, running to the recruiting offices. Some were able to sign up and some were able to get their parents to approve, but most of them were back in school in the eighth because they weren't old enough to serve. I got out uh, in January of 42, a few days after Pearl Harbor, and I uh, was, uh, I was going into uh, pharmacy school in September of 1942 and had been accepted, so I went to Wright Junior College for a short time so that it would be a little lighter because I had to work after school. And while I was in school, the dean urged all of us to enlist in the reserves to at least be able to finish our school year and get credit for a school year. And because I was a pharmacy student, they made me a medic. And I took medical basic and did a few other things and then ended up uh, being shipped to uh, the California port of embarkation for immediate overseas assignment. When I uh, got there, there was no, there was no uh, a bridge going from uh, uh, across the bay. You had to uh, take a ferry boat into San Francisco, and I was transported by MPs to Fort Mason, California. I was there a week because a single person uh, had arrived and they had no record of my coming and they didn't know where I was supposed to be. But I eventually found my outfit and I worked as much as I could in the station hospital so I would be knowledgeable in, no matter what the assignment would end up being. And one day my commanding officer came to me and said that a hospital ship was being formed in Seattle and he had to recommend somebody because of my experience at the hospital. He had recommended me and I was transported to Seattle, Washington where the ship was being refurbished. It had been a luxury liner and one of the reasons that it was being used for hospital ship was because it was too slow to be in a, in a convoy going overseas. Everybody would have to go at our speed. And it was tremendous. It was large. It was beautiful. It was converted. And eventually we were uh, sent through the Panama Canal at least once out of six times. Uh, when they didn't have tractors pulling ships through, but they had live mules. And from there we went to Gibraltar. And from Gibraltar we waited for orders, and the orders came. We were going into Naples, Italy. Things were getting very uh, quiet in Naples, and we were there a short time. We didn't evacuate anybody, but we were prepared to uh, and get involved with the invasion of France from the south, from the Mediterranean side. And we would pull in with the, all the naval bombardments and all the shooting and everything else. White, lit up like a Christmas tree with red crosses all over. We were at the mercy of the enemy, but in Europe they honored the Red Cross and we had no problems. As, as miserable as the Nazis were, our ships were not damaged at all. And after things normalized on the French side, we were ordered back to the States through the Panama Canal. And we were uh, outfitted for 
South Pacific duty. They uh, uh, assigned us, we could only carry uh, medical people, no arms, nothing like uh, war material, and so we were assigned 750 young cadet nurses that had just finished training on our way to the Pacific, they were to be dropped off at Honolulu for reassignment, spread out over all the Pacific. From Hawaii, we went to New Guinea. New Guinea was the hellhole of the war. It was beastly hot with mosquitoes that were king size and uh, we had to have uh, uh, medications to prevent uh, all the diseases that the mosquitoes carry. And so they used a drug that was called Adabrine, and it made your skin and eye whites yellow. So you knew who was from New Guinea because they had a yellow cast to their skin and yellow eyes. From there, we went up to Leyte with all the fighting that was going on. We picked up casualties and evacuated them to New Guinea. Uh, we would then be busy preparing the ship on the way back to Leyte, and we kept doing this. And next it was Luzon, and next it was uh, Manila, and next it was Okinawa. And uh, Okinawa was another bloody mess because the Japanese were not prepared to give up without a real fight. And from there, we were ordered to uh, 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 the first ship to dock in Yokohama, Japan. And there is where we had the biggest mess on our hands. The casualties had been brutalized from the beginning of the war, and they were mistreated, they were not fed, they were full of vermin and fractures that had not been set. They were not treated like human beings. The, the Geneva Conference did not enter the picture for that Pacific assignment, and we started to bring casualties back to the States. Our ship carried 768 wounded. Some were seriously wounded and some were wounded so that they could not go back to assignments. While we were in the Philippines, we would sometimes fill up fast. Sometimes we would get 50, 60 wounded and we would sit in the harbor waiting for more because we were a full hospital ship, a general hospital ship. We had approximately 450 medical people, 27 doctors, 37 nurses, uh, two pharmacists, two chaplains, uh, two lab techs, a Red Cross worker, um, two dentists also, by the way, and um, everybody was busy all the time with their assignments. When we, um, uh, were, we were coming back to the States one time, we lost an x-ray technician and they ended up making me an x-ray technician without training. And that was a rough assignment because I had to pick everything up on my own from the manufacturers uh, instruction book, and I was able to master that and uh, handle all the x-ray work that had to be done on the ship. We um, would come back to the States and be greeted royally with music and movie stars because we always ended up in California, and the patients were all greeted very warmly. The most serious were the last to come off because most of them would come off in wheelchairs or on litters. The more uh, capable that the patient was, they would get off horse and the military would have their families brought to California to uh, uh, 
It still hurts. Tell me some of the funny stuff. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you. It still hurts. You can't forget. Our ship was made up of about 450 medical people, and the ship was made up with approximately 450 merchant crew who ran the ship. Our skipper was a 35-year-old who had his first assignment, and he was probably the most capable man the merchant marine had. We ran into no um, uh, bad experiences with uh, being shot at or being fired on, but we had to uh, we had to travel with uh, lit up like a Christmas tree. The ship was snow white. There were red crosses lit up all over. There were bright green stripes that covered the sides of the ship. It was very comfortable, it was very clean. Our patients received the most wonderful care that they could get at any time. We got back to the States, finally, the last time in December of 45, and we were discharged at Fort Beale, California. Originally, we got back in May of 45, and I thought I would be discharged because they gave you points for time that you spent overseas and time in the service. But they froze my specialty, and I had to make one more trip from May until December. And that was the roughest trip that we had because that's when we got most of the uh, uh, wounded casualties that had been mistreated, abused broken fractures uh, that had never been set. They were never fed properly. They were close to death and covered with diseases, skin diseases and everything else. Now, that's my, that's my story. Do you, have, do you have any questions that I could possibly answer for you? Mr. Broner, I have a question. What, what was your job after, um, after you were discharged from the Army? Hospital ship. Well, I had the uh, I had the GI Bill, and that was a godsend. I just want you to know that the University of Illinois Pharmacy School, when I was a freshman, was eighty dollars a year. <laughs> when I was at Wright, when I was at Wright Junior College, it was seven dollars a semester. Okay, and the GI Bill picked up everything when I went to school after the war, and I got $65 a month for uh, living expenses. Uh, I don't remember how much the uh, GI Bill paid the school, but uh, I became a podiatrist. Okay. Oh. Uh, my medical experience uh, kept me somewhat in the medical field. and. Um, from that, by accident, I ended up working with the hard of hearing. That was a far cry from the feet, but I ended up uh, uh, working as a, 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 a non-graduate audiologist. I had a rewarding uh, life and education. I have uh, three children married. All wonderful, married, wonderful people. I have eight grandchildren, uh, two recently married, and uh, life is good. And you pay a price for living this long, you have to be a little <laughs> bit on the feeble side. <laughs> but otherwise, everything is fine. Everybody take a look at the book. We covered 76,000 miles.
Um, I have behind you, Mr. Grota, the picture of you with some of the medals that you got. Can you explain a couple of the medals that you were re uh, awarded? Well, uh, if, if you turn it around, uh, Marilyn, give me that single picture. It's easier for me to look at it. <laughs> I went in a buck private, I came out a sergeant. Uh, the medal at the far end was one from the Philippine government. It's called the Philippine Liberation Medal. And if you go to the other end, uh, the little round medal with the red, uh, that was a good conduct medal because we never got into any kind of trouble. <laughs> so you got a medal for it. The next one was the American theater that covered everything that the ship went into that uh, was considered overseas assignment. And the next one uh, was the Asiatic Pacific. We were in the uh, uh, Asia and all through the Pacific and the government awarded us a medal for that duty. Uh, the next one um, is the European Theater, Europe Africa Theater uh, medal for serving in Europe and it also included Africa but we had never gone to Africa. And uh, the next one I can't even remember. And Dad was, his parents were immigrants and he lived on the west side of Chicago and had never traveled or you know, they were of modest means and he had never been away from the city before. A lot of the soldiers at that time were like that. They had never been away from their families. So it was, you know, a big adventure. And, and he's a big hero. First time I was on a train other than the CTA was when I went to Camp Grant in Rockford. That was where we were <coughs> being shipped to for the basic training. Basic training was really something. Oh, I know I wanted to tell you something else. Uh, when we got to uh, Camp Grant, we were told to take uh, a bunk and leave every other bunk empty. That was um, because another group was coming in from the south. And uh, the southerners came on the Sunday and they were from Georgia and Tennessee with their deep southern drawls. And um, uh, we were uh, uh, happy to see them. And they were big, strong, ha strapping guys. And one of them and I were talking and he said, he doesn't care what you are as long as you are a Christian. I said, I am not a Christian, I happen to be a Jew. And he had never seen a Jew before in the South. And he looked at me and he said, you look just like everybody else. Yeah. So that went over big. The next experience I had, one of the trips we came back to the States and I got a pass and I could go home. And it wasn't a long pass, they were doing some repair work on the ship. And I got back on the train and walking through was looking for an empty seat. And the only empty seat that I could see was next to an African-American GI who was also in uniform. So I asked him if I could sit down. And so we had a nice talk until we got to Washington, D.C. And he was going further south. And so as we got off the train, he said goodbye. I said, you're going on the same train. And he said, Jim Crow car in the rear. And I didn't know what a Jim Crow car was. Do you guys know what that means? Jim Think Crow. about the timing of like... The whites could sit in the front and the blacks had to sit in the last car. Mm -hmm. That was a blow. Mm -hmm. That was a real blow. Especially for a, for, a, for a man in uniform, he was serving the, his country just as you were, and they still made that law apply to him. My, my first experience before we went overseas in the South was Charleston, South Carolina. That's where we gathered for the overseas assignment to Europe. 
and I have never seen. You just hear. You just hear about what black people endured uh, all the years from slavery. They, they had to tip their hat and step off the sidewalk and let you pass because they couldn't be on the same sidewalk with you. They had to go into the back door of the movie house and sit in the balcony. It was brutal. They couldn't eat in the same restaurant. I got on a bus once and I was going into town on pass. It was the first time I was on a Charleston bus. And I got on, I walked to the back and sat down. Everybody turned around and looked at me. And I didn't know why, so I just sat there. And finally the bus didn't move. And the uh, white passenger comes over. You're sitting in the collet section. I said, all the seats are the same color. You have to move up to the front. That's where the white people sit. The black people sit in the back. I moved to the front and the bus took off. That was what life was like for the African American. Mr. Garner, on, on the Marigold, were there a mix of races? No, you had? it wasn't permitted. It wasn't, okay. It wasn't permitted. Another injustice, when I was in Seattle before we went overseas, we had uh, black Americans that were being trained for duty in the Aleutian Islands because it was feared the Japanese were planning to invade the Aleutians and get, in, get into the North American continent. And so these Americans were in heated barracks, heated barracks, okay? And they brought Italian prisoners of war from overseas for what reason, I don't know, I don't remember. And the black Americans were put into tents and the Italian prisoners of war were put into the warm barracks. And Seattle in January is pretty darn cold like it is here today. And that was American justice. I'm ashamed to say. So the military but that's what treated, went on. The military treated the blacks just like... We had, we had no blacks on our ship. It wasn't, it wasn't permitted. It wasn't permitted in the Navy at all. Sorry. They were black. Uh, uh, service people, but they have their own units. Okay. Mr. Groner, another uh, question comes to mind, and I'm sorry that it's a sad one, but if, um, if a soldier died aboard the Marigold, what happened? Well, there was a little conflict between our uh, chief medical officer, who was a full, full colonel, and the ship skipper, who was a full captain, and we had storage facilities for storing people who died on the ship. Uh, we put them in the coolers until we got back to the States. And a day or so before, they were taken from the coolers and they would dress them in Class A uniforms and prepare them for coming home. I'm glad to hear you. And that was another pain. Yeah. Thank you.